Good morning and welcome to St. Thomas Episcopal Church for the fourth Sunday in Lent. These announcements. Uh, following yesterday's debacle with the quiet day, I uh, want to remind you that the quiet day has been moved to this coming Saturday, same time, 10.30 to 1.30. Um, we will find all of the correct places to click in the proper order so that the technology will work. Um, the invite for Zoom will be the same one to everybody, and we should be able to gather and reflect as we move into the final week of Lent, into Holy Week. So the quiet day, next Saturday, 10.30 to 1, on Zoom, if you want to participate in conversation at the end, and it'll also be live streamed on Facebook. So we invite everybody to, to join us. It's a joint offering of St. Thomas, Epiphany, and St. Luke's. Um, Madre Venda and I will be doing reflections, and Father Wegar will be leading us in prayer, and then we will be more or less a panel for conversation at the end before we leave. The Holy Week schedule will be coming out to you this week. Please mark on your calendar. Unlike most Lents. We've not had a Lenten program this year. And so we really want to put our focus on a good Holy Week. Let me note two kinds of things that will be happening. One, the community observance of Holy Week of the Ministerial Association will be noonday live stream services Monday through Thursday. Uh, more information will be coming out this week. And on Good Friday, there will be the noontime uh, Stations of the Cross in town, and it begins across the street in the FNB parking lot. So that's the, the community ecumenical piece. At St. Thomas, we will have Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, Holy Saturday morning, the Great Vigil of Easter Saturday evening, and Sunday morning worship as usual. Um, so toward the end of the weekend, we have the arc of what's called the Triduum. The days that begin at sunset on Monday, Thursday, and go through Easter at sunset. So those are the most holy days of the Christian year for us. And they are marked by particular liturgies for each day. And, and they are unity. That's a single arc from Maundy Thursday and the celebration of the Eucharist and the stripping of the altar all the way through the great vigil of Easter and the first mass of Easter and Easter morning. So please mark your calendars. Everything will be at 6.30 except Sunday morning. Thursday, Friday, Saturday evening, 6.30. The Easter Vigil is going to be our big celebration of Easter. And the, the tradition of the ancient church, which gathered at sunset on Easter Eve and held vigil until midnight when the first Mass of Easter was celebrated and continued to celebrate until sunrise. Uh, we're not going to do that. But we are going to have the great vigil at 6.30, and that will be much like Lessons and Carols at Christmas time. That's the model. It's a series of readings and songs and canticles and, and prayers. It's a lengthy service. The liturgy is a vigil liturgy. And vigil is about waiting and anticipating. And it's, it's designed to set us up like Christmas morning rubrics that don't even think of getting out of bed before 6.30 and waking the parents if you want to see next Christmas. Okay? So it, it's going to be anticipatory. We're going to gather and keep vigil, wait and watch, and then we're going to celebrate with great joy 
the first Holy Eucharist of Easter, the celebration of the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. Sunday morning at 10 o'clock will be Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. Okay? Now, here's the news you've been waiting for. The metrics are right. The protocols are in place. And beginning next Sunday, Palm Sunday, Passion Sunday, we will regather here at church inside to celebrate Holy Eucharist at 10, 10 o'clock. So beginning next Sunday, 10 o'clock, inside Holy Eucharist. The protocols require masking and distancing. Require. It's not optional. We don't encourage you to do it. We don't hope you will do it. You must do it. There are 22 spaces in the nave. If we have more than 22 people, we will have set up in Pipkin Parlor an overflow area so that you can participate on live stream. Uh, and then you'll come in for your communion. So next Sunday, beginning next Sunday, inside, 22 people in the nave, overflow in Pipkin Parlor. Um, and we'll continue to do that as long as we can. And hopefully, we will not ever have to stop. Okay? So there, there's your Holy Week gift. It also means that Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, the Great Vigil, Easter Day, will be inside. Inside. Okay. And that does it for the announcements this week.
Morning prayer begins on page 38. For those of you following in the prayer book, write one, page 38. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I will arise and go to my Father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Jesus said, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross, and follow me. Page 42. O Lord, open thou our lips. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray together the Venite. Page 43. The Lord is full of compassion and mercy. O come, let us adore him. Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and raise a loud shout to him with songs. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are the caverns of the earth, and the heights of the hills are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have molded the dry land. Come, let us bow down and bend the knee, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would hearken to his voice. portion of Psalter appointed for today is Psalm 107, beginning on page 746, verses 1 through 3, and then 17 through 22. 1 through 3, 17 to 22. Let us pray the psalm together. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. Let all those whom the Lord has redeemed proclaim that he redeemed them from the hand of the foe. He gathered them out of the lands, from the east and from the west, and from the north and from the south. Some were fools and took to rebellious ways. They were afflicted because of their sins. They abhorred all manner of food and drew near to death's door. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent forth his word and healed them and saved them from the grave. Let them give thanks to the Lord for his mercy and the wonders he does for his children. Let them offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving and tell of his acts with shouts of joy. A reading from the book of Numbers. From Mount Hor, the Israelites set out by the way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became un impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. 
Why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then the Lord sent poisonous serpents among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the serpents from us. So Moses prayed for the people, and the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole. And whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together Canticle 18. Canticle 18 on page 93 in the prayer book. Canticle 18, page 93. Splendor and honor and kingly power are yours by right, O Lord our God. For you created everything that is, and by your will they were created and have their being. And yours by right, O Lamb that was slain, for with your blood you have redeemed for God from every family, language, people, and nation a kingdom of priests to serve our God. And so to him who sits upon the throne and to Christ the Lamb, be worship and praise, dominion and splendor forever and forevermore. A reading from the epistle to the Ephesians. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following under the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. And of us once lived, all of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love which he, with which he loved us even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Jesus Christ. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are what he has made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. The word of the Lord. Let us pray together Canticle 14 on page 90 in the prayer book. Canticle 14, page 90. O Lord and ruler of the hosts of heaven, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and of all their righteous offspring. You made the heavens and the earth with all their vast array. All things quake with fear at your presence. They tremble because of your power. But your merciful promise is beyond all measure. It surpasses all that our minds can fathom. O Lord, you are full of compassion. 
long-suffering and abounding in mercy. You hold back your hand. You do not punish as we deserve. Your great goodness, Lord. You have promised forgiveness to sinners that they may repent of their sin and be saved. And now, O oh Lord, I bend the knee of my heart and make my appeal sure of your gracious goodness. I have sinned, O oh Lord, I have sinned, and I know my wickedness only too well. Therefore, I make this prayer to you. Forgive me, Lord, forgive me. Do not let me perish in my sin, nor condemn me to the depths of the earth. For you, O oh Lord, are the God of those who repent, and in me you will show forth your goodness. Unworthy as I am, you will save me in accordance with your mercy. And I will praise you without ceasing all the days of my life. For all the powers of heaven sing your praises. And yours is the glory to ages of ages. Amen. A reading from the Gospel according to John. Jesus said, Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. The word of the Lord. Let us pray together Canticle 2 on page 49 in the prayer book. Canticle 2, page 49. Blessed art thou, O Lord God of our fathers, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou for the name of thy majesty, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou in the temple of thy holiness, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou that beholdest the depths and dwellest between the cherubim, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou on the glorious throne of thy kingdom, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou in the firmament of heaven, praised and exalted above all forever. Blessed art thou, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, praised and exalted above all forever.
Let us now affirm our faith in the Apostles' Creed, page 53 in the prayer book. Affirming our faith with the Apostles' Creed, page 53. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit. Let us pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us. And grant us thy salvation. Endue thy ministers with righteousness. And make thy chosen people joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in thee can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under thy care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let thy way be known upon earth. Thy saving hell among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. Gracious Father, whose blessed Son, Jesus Christ, came down from heaven to be the true bread which gives life to the world. Evermore give us this bread, that he may live in us and we in him, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The prayers of the people are page 383 in the prayer book. Page 383. With all our heart and with all our mind, let us pray to the Lord, saying, Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above, for the loving kindness of God, and for the salvation of our souls, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For the peace of the world, for the welfare of the Holy Church of God, and for the unity of all peoples, let us pray to the Lord. Lord have mercy. For our bishops, Samuel our diocesan, and Anne our suffragan, and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for our president, for the leaders of the nations, and for all in authority, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for this city of Reedsville, the county of Rockingham, for every city and community, for those who live in them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for seasonable weather and for an abundance of the fruits of the earth, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the good earth which God has given us, and for the wisdom and will to conserve it, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for those who travel on land, on water, or in the air, or through outer space, let us pray to the Lord. Lord for the aged and infirm, for the widowed and orphaned, 
and for the sick and the suffering, let us pray to the Lord. Let us remember especially those who have asked us to hold them in our hearts before the Lord this day. Tish, Cheryl, Sandra, Kathy, Diane, Liz, Judy, Daffy, Janet, Steve, Dan, Andrea, Sam, Bill and Hazel, Anne, Beth, Mary Beth and Bill, June, the Saxon family, Doug and Robin, Brother Stephen, Stan, Evan, Jason and Janie, Mike, David, James, Chris and Jim, Rick, Devin, Pierre, Marie Noel. For those in the military, Michael, Claire, Daniel, Ben, Forrest, Jonathan, Hunter, and Jim. And for all others known to us. For the poor and the oppressed, for the unemployed and the destitute, for prisoners and captives, and for all who remember and care for them, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For all who have died in the hope of the resurrection, and for all the departed, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. And we especially remember Marco, Mary, Michael, Joan, and those who mourn, Chilton and her family, the Cobb and Robertson families, the McKay family, the Foster family, the Falcone family and Pat, for Barbara and family, for the Hook and Cordy families, for the Hodges family. For deliverance from all danger, violence, oppression, and degradation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the absolution and remission of our sins and offenses, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. That we may end our lives in faith and hope without suffering and without reproach, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. Defend us, deliver us, and in thy compassion protect us, O Lord, by thy grace. In the communion of St. Thomas, our patron, and of all the saints, let us commend ourselves and one another and all our life to Christ our God. Be O Lord our God. Lord, you hear the prayers of your people. What we have asked faithfully grant that we may obtain effectually to the honor and glory of your name through Jesus Christ our Lord. The General Thanksgiving, page 58, page 58. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, thine unworthy servants, do give thee most humble and hearty thanks for all thy goodness and loving kindness to us and to all men. We bless thee for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for thine inestimable love and the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we beseech thee, give us that due sense of all thy mercies, that our hearts may be unfeignedly thankful, 
and that we show forth thy praise not only with our lips but in our lives by giving up ourselves to thy service and by walking before thee in holiness and righteousness all our days. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with thee and the Holy Ghost be all honor and glory, world without end. Amen. Almighty God, who has given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee, and hast promised through thy well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, thou wilt be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth and in the world to come, life everlasting. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The lessons today remind us that we are sinful people, at least two out of three of the lessons. And they remind us that our sinfulness has an extraordinarily long history, that it indeed goes back at least as far as the Exodus. And we have a story from Numbers, which is a story about what scholars call the murmuring tradition, because the, the Hebrew word that's used here for complaining is murmuring. And it, it means complaining in the sense of whining and complaining, as in okay, we're going to sing only your favorite hymns for this month, and somebody inevitably will go, oh, do we have to? <laughs> the people of Israel, granted, were not in a really good place. They were out in the middle of the desert. They didn't know where they were going. They didn't know how they were going to get there. They'd already had this debacle with the golden calf. So they knew God was there. They weren't real sure that God or Moses was going to get them where they were supposed to be going, wherever that was. So in a sense, they found themselves much in the same position as their forefather Abraham. God said, Pick up and go, and I'll tell you when you get where you're going. And we know about ourselves and about organizations and groups and countries that that kind of ambiguity produces anxiety. We get itchy. We get grumpy. We don't think real well because we're so anxious. And we want certainty. We want direction. We want leadership in which we have confidence to get us where we need to go. Moses, bless his heart, did the best he could to herd the cats. He had no easy task. He was dealing with an anxious group of people. And in a typical kind of way, they all complained about the food. It's sort of like listening to undergraduates complain about the, the refectory or the cafeteria or whatever they call it these days. The food is uniformly good, I mean bad uniformly bad. 
no matter how much of it they shovel down on a regular basis. It's terrible. But Moses, good pastor that he was, talks to God, and God is not happy. And what God is telling the people of, of God is that their murmuring has consequences. Their anxiety has consequences. They're not taking a deep breath and trusting God who just brought them out of Israel. I mean, brought them out of Egypt. On the way to Israel. The God of the Exodus, the God of the Ten Plagues, the God of Passover. They need to breathe and to trust. They need to live into their Abrahamic heritage that God will get them where they need to be. But we begin to see the pattern of the relationship between Israel and God. Covenant, living into it, breaking it, consequences, and reconciliation. We begin to see that from God's perspective, sin and brokenness, stupidity and anxiety, selfishness, are not our end. Indeed, they're not even our purpose. And certainly not our end. And the process of remedy comes when you and I recognize that we have gone off the rails. That we are off the path wandering in the wilderness or in the weeds or whatever image you want to use that things are not right, that we are not right, that our anxiety is ruling us instead of we managing our anxiety. And in that moment of realization comes the moment of repentance, that moment in which we say from the depths of our being, I got to turn back. And not only I got to turn back, I've got to return to God. I've got to own this. I've got to name it. And I need to seek forgiveness so I can go forward. And what we see in this story and in the whole relationship of God and the people of Israel and in God's relationship with us and the church as individuals, is that when we repent, when we realize we're off the rails and something has to be done, and that something is to turn back to God and seek forgiveness, that God receives us and God forgives us. God shows us a way forward in the case of the people in the wilderness, it was the bronze snake on the pole. And look at it if you get bitten. You know, that tradition still lives in the Orthodox churches where the bishop carries a staff with a bronze snake rather than a shepherd's crook. It continues in the medical symbol of the Medusa. But God shows us a way forward. And that's what we have vowed to do in our baptism. Will you continue in the apostles' teaching and fellowship, the breaking of the bread and the prayers? And the next question is, when you fall into sin, will you repent and seek God's forgiveness? It's a deep deep part of who we are with God. And Lent calls us 
not to waller in our sinfulness. Lent invites us to repentance, to name and own the places where our anxiety has gotten the best of us where we have done those things which we ought not to have done and left undone those things which we ought to have done. And the result is that we're broken and bruised and hurt and more or less dysfunctional. We're not ourselves. We're not ourselves. And the invitation of Lent is to return with God's help to being ourselves in the new life of grace through Christ empowered by the Spirit. In the epistle today, we see the early language, the language of the first century, which is somewhat dualist, where things of the flesh and the world are bad and things of the spirit are good. And, and we have this obsession of living in the world and the flesh and the desires. And it's a very complicated thing, which has resulted in some very unfortunate consequences for all of us. It looks like mad body images. It looks like strange and embarrassed and negative concepts of what a human being is, of our physical identity, of our sexual identities, of our morals, of loving the world. We're told, you know, on the one hand, love the world, love the beauty preserve the world, the ecology of the world is important, be an environmentalist. And yet in scripture we hear a message that says, you know, the world, the flesh, and the devil are going to get you if you're not careful. The world and the flesh and the devil are the sources of evil, they are the context of evil, and when we pay attention to them, we are doing sinful things. Now it leaves us, as one way I once said, that there, there are some, of, some among the Christian folk whose greatest fear in all the world is that somewhere, somehow, somebody might almost be about to have fun. So we have something of a mixed message. The only thing we've got is our flesh. It's who we are. And we're supposed to love ourselves as we love God and love our neighbor. We all know there's only one way to get more of us. And yet in the tradition, sex has been another way to spell sin. What do we do with that during Lent? You know, what do we do with that? And Interestingly, the clue is exactly in this piece from Ephesians. By grace, you and I have been saved. Because we have faith, we believe in God, we are open to God. God's response is to come to us in love. And that's what grace is. Grace is not a thing. You don't take 10 milligrams of grace three times a day for your life. And Lent reminds us that God's will for us is life, not death. God's will for us is to live fully into being the image and likeness of God that each of us particularly is created to be. And to live in that image and likeness with joy and wonder and energy and creativity and lovingness, just like God comes to us in love. God comes in grace, and that saves us 
in the sense of God's coming in love to us, makes us whole again, restores us as image and likeness. Over and over and over again, God's will for us and coming to us is not about beating us up about our failures and our sin or our brokenness or our bruises or our hurts or our failures. It's about reminding us of our dreams and our hopes and our capacity to do the good because that is who we are. And therefore, that is what we are created to do. Lent is a time of renewal, of reconnecting with the God who has chosen in absolute freedom to be connected to us in love, to give God's self to us so that we can fully be the people that God has created us to be. We have to get over the dualism. We have to get over that bit of cultural Calvinism, the Puritan work ethic, that says our value is in strictly adhering to some code of morality that's about that wide, that we're only as good as our work is. We're only as good as we are a part of the dominant culture. What we are invited and meant to do is to sit with God to get over that to go into the world comfortable, and more than comfortable, joyful in our own skin, really literally. That this stuff that we are, this flesh, is good stuff. And out of this good stuff comes many good things. Love, and care, and creativity, and productivity. And it looks like being a plumber, or an electrician, or a carpenter, or a nurse, or a doctor, or a teacher. Of being old and being young, of being white and being black and being indigenous. See, the thing is that the message of Lent is an invitation to come and sit with God and get in touch again, deeper and fuller, with the fact that we are because God loves us. And because God so loves the world, God gave God's only Son that we might have eternal life. God's will for us is indeed, as St. Athanasius very early in the life of the church said, God's will for us is that we become by grace God's self gift and love. What God is by nature. God's will for us is that we be more and more fully clearly, powerfully, effectively, the image and likeness of God. God's will for us is life in its creative, splendid, holy, mysterious abundance. And so if we move closer and closer to the celebration of Easter, Indeed, the process is to strip away more and more our anxiety, our obsession with our brokenness, more and more to live into the question, what can I do? What can we do as church, as community, as state, as country? What is it that God is giving us to do that gives life in its abundance? 
What is it that we are invited to do through Christ in the Spirit? To raise people up, to touch each other with healing, to make us whole. And as we come clearer and clearer to see that, then the clarity of Easter and resurrection becomes deeper and richer and more filled with unbridled joy. The good news of Lent is about coming to that possibility for Christ's sake, in Christ, through Christ, with Christ, in the power of the Spirit, for the good of us, the good of God's beloved, all of God's beloved. God, who so loves us that you came among us in the flesh. O God, who so loves us that you continue to abide in us and with us and through us in the Holy Spirit. Grant us grace and give us hearts and minds and souls to receive you in that giving. 
that in the power of the Spirit we may be raised to the new life of grace in Jesus Christ. And with hope and conviction and love go forth into this world to love and serve you in our love and service of one another. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and evermore. Amen.